when you're chasing that seven figure business because because there's people online talking about their seven figure business their eight figure business their whatever you don't un- you don't know the, the full story do you mm-hmm. you don't it's like these coaches oh my like seven figure launch yeah but you spent like 900 grand on facebook ads come on like let's tell the truth about this and on this episode i am blessed to be joined by the one and only amanda perry amanda is an exited founder she is an adhd coach and the founder of the founder brain community amanda thank you so much for coming on the show thank you so much for having me i feel um yeah honored it's nice to get out of sheffield for the day as well yeah amazing <laughs> really appreciate you coming down and as i said on your podcast the other day Every time I'm scrolling through Instagram <laughs> and I just see uh, an ADHD meme, which makes me feel incredibly seen <laughs> and sure that someone is tracking me. It's always coming from your account and I love seeing all the content that you post on there. Oh, thank you, Roy. Thanks so much. So just going straight into um, something we just mentioned, medication, because I know there's the shortage at the moment and there's lots of people having um, serious issues with it right now. Mm. And it's For me, ADHD is no longer a taboo at all to be discussed. And I think it's something which, you know, we, we are very, very open um, about and, and talk lots about but for some reason medication is still at times a bit of a, a touchy subject yeah so what, what's your view on that why is that the case and what's your journey with ADHD and medication I think that there's a couple of reasons why medication is a touchy subject because no one wants to no one wants to like advocate for medication do they it's such a personal thing so I personally don't talk about medication online in my community I just think it's very it's one thing kind of going out there with this is my experience of ADHD this is how it impacts me yours might be different it's another thing completely I think to say I take these medic this medication this is how it makes me feel you should try it too like Mm. I don't know that just feels like there's a line there and I think that while ADHD isn't taboo isn't taboo full stop let's put a full stop there (laughs) there is still this huge subcontext that you know this narrative that it's just yesterday philippa perry did a um article in the guardian saying adhd is just fashionable now and it's just this social like construct from you know how we're influencing each other online and i the amount of times I see people talk about ADHD with this, like, kind of, oh, are you going to mm. judge me? I, pro- you know, I, ha- I met, um, I'm like diagnosed. I have got it. It is real, mm. and I just think that's it. It makes it harder to talk about it. So then, when you're looking at medication, you're already if you're talking about ADHD online, and I have this every day. You're already opening yourselves up, self up to people who are going to tell you that it's made up or mm. everyone's a bit ADHD, then to start talking about medication is just, you know, it's just an, an another step that I'm not comfortable with personally. Mm, that's really interesting. And I, I wasn't aware of that article. And um, yeah, it's, it's a really, really funny one, ADHD, because I don't know how you feel about it, but there are some days where I'm like, okay, my ADHD is under control. And I'm really happy to talk about it because actually it's really serving me very well right Mm. now. Maybe I'm in hyper-focus mode or maybe it's giving me the energy that I need. But there are times, to be frankly, you know, transparent about this, where ADHD management is the only thing that I can do that day, right? It's just a constant battle of trying to manage, Mm. you know, getting enough dopamine but not too much dopamine. How can I focus? How can I function like a normal normal human being? Whatever that is. Um, (laughs) And, and I think you're right. That That is why people may be a little hesitant to, uh, to disclose that. Mm. But for anyone listening who is feeling like, well, I'm not sure if I should be talking about this. Maybe I'm, I'm a bit uh, concerned my employer is going to mm. see me differently. It might, you know, um, hold me back from some opportunities at work, for example. Lo- lots of things that I think um, people with ADHD will resonate with. W- w- what do you say to them? It's so difficult, isn't it? I mean... Someone literally messaged me on Instagram this morning and said, I've got my appraisal this afternoon. Should I tell my boss? And I was like, I mean, I I can't tell you that off a message. I would need some more context. But the short answer is, if they're supportive and you think that telling them will be a positive thing, then yeah, absolutely. If they're not, then find another job. Like, that's, Mm. that's the top and bottom, isn't it? But there is still this... 
you know as a as a founder there's there's always that balance between looking after your team and looking after the business isn't there so if someone's coming to you and telling you that they have ADHD or autism or whatever it is and all you know is this article you've seen from Philippa Perry that's saying it's just fashionable it's a social construct we spend too much time on TikTok it's not unreasonable for them to think like all right okay yeah and not even open the conversation about what accommodations you might need let alone take them seriously Mm. so I just think we're living in a really difficult time where it's so we're in our own echo chambers aren't we so the people who see it see it see a lot of it and the people who don't see it maybe don't see it at all because when people say to me, oh, yeah, I see the content on TikTok, I immediately think, well, you've got ADHD then. <laughs> That's the only reason you're seeing it. You know, <laughs> if, you, if you're, you're not interested in that content, if you don't display those behaviours, the algorithm's not going to find you. So mm. it's really difficult. I think we're still a way off. It, it's like, for me, it's like the whole conversation around unmasking. You know, it's a similar conversation in the workplace. Can you unmask? Can you unmask in your business? We're like a huge way off from understanding and having that collective understanding. You know, it was only a few years ago we had like Black Lives Matter. How long have we known about racism? Like mm-hmm. we are we are years and years away from it being accepted and people actually being able to be themselves and have that understanding of I'm not being um, short or snappy with you I'm just a bit overwhelmed I'm uh, you know emotionally dysregulated how do you how do you have all of that nuance you know if you've got a team of even a small team of let's say 10 how do you how do you manage all of that nuance it's really really difficult I think it's a real challenge and the you know the LinkedIn answer Mm -hmm. is to say Of course, we fully support our team and, you know, anyone can come to whatever they have and whatever accommodations, but we have to look at the reality, which isn't that simple. It's not that black and white, is it? Yeah, absolutely. And I think one of the things that I've seen anyway, even on the LinkedIn narrative side of it, um, 2021, when the world had lots of money, people could afford to care more about these things. And I think it very, very quickly gets... Um, de-emphasize and deprioritize the times when things do get tougher uh, which I guess really just is a vicious cycle then for people who are even more concerned about their jobs than they would have been a couple of years ago it makes them less likely to be their authentic selves yeah. you know in the workplace but I think there's a massive onus on management within these companies and larger organizations I think um, you know founders should be very very you know, flexible with their working policies. It should be easy for a founder to implement neurodiversity accommodation, right? And and really any diversity accommodation because you're starting from, you know, zero infrastructure so you can set things up the right way. But it's amazing. I mean, I'm sure you've had this so many times. I I gave a talk at a really large um, corporate real estate company. Uh, This must have been last year. And uh, about neurodiversity in the workplace. And the hot topic for that day within this company was should people be allowed to work with headphones on and it was like that's that's the level that they're at right oh now is like wearing headphones is a controversial thing to yeah. do while working and it's like how is someone who has you know their own very very specific ways of working which needs them to have um you know some silence or even a dark space something like that to work in when it's still controversial to put on headphones yeah what chance have you got to survive yeah. in a corporate like that yeah and that's not even looking at like at physical infrastructure of open plan offices and all the noise and the stimulation that comes with that. I guess if I mean if we if we work it right back, it comes down to it comes down to trust, doesn't it? Ultimately, you're trusting that person that regardless of whether they've got headphones on, they're working in the office, they're working from home, they're working from a coffee shop you know they're working in a way they're working your core hours or they they start a bit later finish a bit later it's that you trust them to do the job which comes back to recruitment employer brand Mm. culture all of that kind of really really foundational stuff doesn't it Mm. which when you're starting a business and you're a founder 
isn't your isn't the number one thing, is it? You're not you're not thinking about the team. You're thinking about building the product and an investment and surviving and how am I going to get past next month mm-hmm. and you know all of that stuff is so retrospective that I think yeah maybe that's where that's where we come into problems. I've I've certainly seen it where you know people it only takes hiring a couple of the wrong people, doesn't it? To really, really, you know, those rotten apples that just spoil the whole cart. I've, I've seen it. I've experienced it, and and it's it's really, really hard to sometimes identify the apples. Mm, absolutely, and I think as well, especially when we are people who are very, you know, conscientious about the different styles of working. Mm. S- sometimes the brutality needed in removing people from teams when you're in startup mode is uh is difficult right really hard yeah really really hard i I feel like you're such an empathetic person i can't imagine you ever firing anyone amanda oh my (laughs) god well yeah i'm sure there'll be a few people writing in (laughs) hearing that then (laughs) i've had to you have to but the problem is being completely um transparent and vulnerable which doesn't always come easily to me is that because i'm so empathetic and that how that kind of interplays with like RSD and my ADHD brain and overthinking and I I never do it in the right way mm. you know I never approach it in the right way it's like it's like kind of um you know opening the door chucking a bomb in and closing the yeah, door really yeah, yeah. quickly it's, <laughs> and I I hold my hands up to that is not my I I've had two businesses now where I've I've had large teams yeah and I am big enough and ugly enough to admit that that is not my thing Mm. (laughs) i will not be doing that again so and and now that i know about adhd and about everything that comes with it i know why and that's a huge thing isn't it yeah absolutely and that's why it's such a a light bulb moment and Mm. can be such a cathartic experience for lots of people because not just understanding oh that explains why i was doing xyz but actually giving them a framework to say well Therefore, maybe it's going to be better for me to focus on doing, you know, ABC. And that's going to suit me better, being very hyper real about my strengths and my weaknesses and all that side of it uh, as well. And I think, you know, as a real founder, very, very rare that founders are also the people who enjoy managing large teams. Oh, right. It's just totally two different ends of the spectrum, right? Yeah. Yeah, totally. I think my problem is that I... I never quite got to the point in any of my businesses. It was always like me, everyone else. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I never quite got to the point where I could effectively implement a middle management. And I always tried. But yeah, that that was the, the real difficulty for me. Just that people management. I would, mm. I always say if I could just employ mind readers. And my, my poor husband, I, I don't know how he lives with me. Because he's like... <laughs> you know trying to ask me something and i'm like what how what, how don't you know that you know yeah. i don't know it i had to find it out and yeah. that's kind of the frustration i think we're often i think we can easily fall into some kind of martyr behavior because our brains generally work quickly we've we've you know i'm always telling people it's a no-brainer mm-hmm. and they and i and my friend who did the strengths actually said to me it's a no-brainer to you but they haven't got there that they yet you know you're mm-hmm. you're trying to tell them that this thing that takes them from here to here is a no-brainer but they're still here mm-hmm. so there's a lot of that isn't there there's a lot of us being able to do 10 times the work in you know in a day as as some people um, and that can often lead to that feeling of like, why am I doing everything? Yeah, a hundred percent. And it's it's really really interesting because I always felt that there was a massive link between ADHD and anxiety for mm. me anyway. And a lot of the symptoms of ADHD presented like the symptoms of anxiety for me. You know, getting flustered and having to calculate lots of different things yeah. or. For example, timing of getting from one place to another. And like, oh, God, if I've got to be here there at 11, then I need to wake up at 3. And if I leave there, <laughs> yeah. I need to put my shirt here and my shoes with me by the door. Like, it's just, you know, constantly trying to calculate and prepare for any outcome, which maybe it was ADHD, maybe, maybe trying to manage the ADHD because I know if I don't 
meticulously plan for it, then it won't happen. Mm. Maybe it's an anxiety response thing. But one question I have for you, and this is taking it to uh, um, a bit of a different level. Where does ADHD come from? W what is ADHD? Is it something that we're born with? Is it something that develops over time? You know, what what is your view around that? Because, uh, you know, I read something very recently about ADHD being potentially trauma response induced mm. as well. I mean, there's so much interesting theory around where it comes from. What do you think? I think that, well, that's the two theories, isn't it? That, that you know, I think it's Gabor Mate that yeah. has the trauma theory, trauma in childhood. I personally, um, so when I got diagnosed, I got diagnosed, my sister got diagnosed and my mum did at the same time. And and so for me, there's no question that it's genetic. And I've seen, you know, the people that I speak to who only get to their diagnosis because they're researching it for their child, mm. you know? And the, the, I mean, the complexity and the kind of guilt associated with that is just crazy. But for me, there's no doubt that it's genetic. Whether something can happen, uh, something trauma-related to kind of rewire your brain, which we know is possible, whether that can also trigger ADHD, I don't know. For me, and in my, my case, it's... It's genetic, and it's a bit like, I mean, it's like anything, isn't it? We we say, well, why has it suddenly appeared? But I think back to my nan, mm -hmm. you know, my grandparents that I remember, and I can identify which one of them was neurodivergent and mm -hmm. where it's come from. And, you know, just because it wasn't recognised doesn't mean that it wasn't a thing. For it's sure. like anything, isn't it? You think of the, the witches that they burnt at the stake. They were probably just women with ADHD, you yeah. know? They were a bit mad. <laughs> like, it, th that's, that's how it works, isn't it? We understand more about medicine. They create these models, this collection of symptoms that they give a name to. A mm. terrible name, by the way. I don't know about you, but I have never lacked attention yeah. <laughs> ever in my life. I have too much, if, if anything. Um, so, yeah, I, I have no doubt that it comes from genetics. What, why, what do you think? What's your thoughts on it? Super interesting. Thank you so much for that there. And actually, I, I think you're 100% right on the um, almost misclassification of ADHD. Mm. I think we're not far away from there being, you know, ADHD type 1, type 2. And right. there being a much, and there needs to be a much further breakdown, yeah. right? Because it does feel, or at least the general understanding of it feels very, very broad. Mm. And because it is such, people talk about the, you know, autism spectrum. I believe ADHD is a spectrum as well. Yeah, um, I think some people have, you know, milder symptoms of it. Some people have extreme symptoms of it. Mm. Um, so I think, uh, I think there does need to be better classification uh, in order to have more meaningful um, response, more meaningful treatments for it as well. Mm. Um, it's a really interesting, the trauma response one. I, there's a lot that is congruent with trauma response within ADHD symptoms. For example, the need to calculate quickly. Yeah. Right? And that the hypervigilance and the... Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So I think there is there is a lot of overlap. And also, it's really interesting. There was a study done, I, I want to say John Hopkins, uh, somewhere, somewhere in, the, in the US, uh, about the... Uh, gener intergenerational impact on um, the neuro on neurological pathways uh, from trauma. So they were mm. basically half drowning mice, which is oh, sounds pretty. I, I mean, well, so <laughs> probably makes it a good study then. Yeah. So they're, they're sort of half drowning mice, and they could see that the um, the neurological impacts of that trauma was then carried down into ge three generations. Right, yeah, yeah. Right, so, so it's, a, it's a really interesting one. Yeah. Um, impossible to say, though, right? Impossible yeah. for us to understand, actually, the the reality of it. Yeah, and I think that, yeah, I mean, there's, there's, there's just so much at the moment, isn't there? We're learning so much about it so quickly, and I think that's why I have this... I don't know, I kind of had a bit of an ick recently with like doing ADHD content because mm. I just feel this, I'm really sick of the whole like, oh, I've lost my keys kind of content. And and brilliant, you know, you're going to get a huge reach and loads of engagement and your account will grow really fast, which is actually what happened to mine. Mm -hmm. And all that happened then was that it led to complete burnout. I didn't want to post anything, didn't want to create anything, didn't want to ever talk about ADHD again in my life. <laughs> and then I'm like... I've just built this business around ADHD and now I've done the most ADHD thing and I don't want to talk about it ever again. 
But it's it's not that. It's the nuance of it that really, really fascinates me. For mm. me, it's the crossover with business, um, but also the nuance in other people's areas, how, you know, marginalised communities don't get diagnosed and it just gets completely overlooked and where ADHD does overlap with autism and a whole other conversation. But I think that's a really difficult area online as well. I... I recognise a lot of autistic traits, mm. but I I very much doubt I'd meet criteria of a of a diagnosis. I mean, maybe I would, but um, but talking about that online is really really difficult because you have people who are, you know, I'm autistic, I'm ADHD, I'm or DHD as they call it when people have both. Oh right, okay. So I think yeah, even that kind of we've kind of. Um, the neurodivergent community, I think, have created a bit of a them and us thing. And I think maybe that's one of the problems with social media, that mm. people want to identify with something so much that it does create a them and us between, you know, the neurodivergences. So you're either autistic or ADHD and we're going to argue about what the symptoms are. Or the bigger them and us is, you know, neurodivergence versus neurotypicals, like mm. that, you know, them. Mm. And that's, that's not helpful to No, anyone. of course. And, I mean, what is a neurotypical brain, right? I mean, there, exactly. there, there is no us versus them. I mean, no. who's the... I want to find the one person who's the neurotypical, <laughs> right? Um, it's my husband. <laughs> yeah, He's, okay. like, the most... <laughs> honestly, I don't know how we ever met, let alone got married, but literally, his brain is literally like yeah. this. Okay, so he, he is he ground is, zero. He's, he's the, the case. neurotypical person. Yeah. <laughs> okay, fine. So that's a really interesting topic. Um, tell us about ADHD and relationships. What is advice that you would give to someone who is in uh, a relationship with someone who has ADHD? And what does that look like? And Other than good luck, right? I mean, <laughs> fucking good luck, honestly. I, d I don't know what's easier, to be honest. I have So I know people who are in relationships with, like... ADHD people with ADHD partners and then and within that you know the whole type one type two thing so if you're both I know people who are relation in relationships and they're both inattentive mm -hmm. and that definitely brings its own issues in a relationship because you know stuff just doesn't get done mm -hmm. <laughs> and me and my husband were talking about this the other day I was saying I don't know I can't imagine an inattentive person being with a hyperactive person or would you balance each other out all I know is that my husband has the patience of a saint yeah and he I mean god love this man he is honestly he's just I mean I'm biased but he's absolutely incredible and I said to him once we were talking I said um, what word would you use to describe me? It come up on something, and he said misunderstood. Ah, and that it is just like those things where, like, he sees beyond the me snapping and you know mood dysregulation and things that are really, really difficult for people to deal with. And I, I know that you know when I'm in that moment, all I'm thinking about is trying to regulate myself. But I also have to be aware of how it comes across to other people, which is that I'm blocking them out or not speaking mm. to them. And I'm I'm not even aware of that. All I, I'm inside my head. That's all I'm thinking about. And he he's just learned to kind of understand that and know that I ju he knows when I need space. He knows. Mm. And that's not it's a lot to ask of someone. You know, yeah. it's not easy. Yeah, absolutely. But it's, it's amazing that you, you know, that there is that understanding there mm. because you're right. It, sometimes these things do present as being uninterested or being difficult. But yeah, you're right. It's just it's that constant uh, need to just manage the ADHD, right? Yeah, it's and that's just... why it's exhausting, isn't mm. it? Because we have this, like, we're managing our external world, we're managing our internal world, and then we're trying to manage the kind of Venn diagram bit in the middle where yeah. the two clash and yes. where other people are impacted. And it's, it's yeah, we can really easily kind of think ourselves round into a spin, can't yeah, we? Yeah, definitely. And I think it's one of the... I think anyway, one of the reasons why so many people with ADHD go down the entrepreneurial route, because mm. for me, any with ADHD, my worst fear is the to-do list runs out. Yeah. Right. We talk about yeah, the, having yeah. the to-do list, but I, I'm terrified when that to-do list yeah, runs yeah. out because then it's just ADHD management. Yeah. You know, it, it's if I've got nothing to do on a weekend, mm -hmm. it's like, oh, this is going to be a tough weekend. Oh, my God. Why are weekends so hard? I talk about Brutal. this a lot on Instagram. <laughs> 
like everyone's like yay it's the weekend and we're like yay <laughs> brilliant 48 hours of like nothing yeah. amazing it's so, it's yeah it's so hard yeah but we but we need them probably more than most people mm. we need that rest but yeah on days where you know my when i had my agency my days would just be f- full if i hadn't filled it if someone else had filled it you know i was terrible at boundaries any kind of t- time blocking anything like that now that i'm working at home by myself i purposely have monday and friday clear to set mm-hmm. the week up and mm-hmm. wrap the week up and so- sometimes they're my worst days because you know if i haven't got things planned in and calls or the worst thing and you'll know this when you go into waiting mode so you've got nothing but like a four mm-hmm. o'clock call and then nothing gets done all the, day the, the you're just ADHD like, paralysis yeah right? just waiting mode you're like right i've got a call at four so uh, exactly what you were saying if i if i start if i get the link at about three then <laughs> yeah. i'll be ready for the it's just yeah yeah it's, it's crazy ending. right it mm. is crazy but it's funny like i uh always have like an optimism of my ability to handle it. It's like, yeah, cool, I did the meeting at four. And like, yeah, I'll be fine. <laughs> yeah. And every time it comes around, it's like, why do I do this yeah. to myself? I never learn. Um, but out of interest, what does that what does that look like for you? Let's say, you know, there's a day off or there's nothing on. Like, what are the techniques that you use to try and control your ADHD? And just for anyone who isn't aware of this, for me, like losing control of my ADHD means just... Um, instant gratification dopamine hunting yeah. basically is what it means for me whatever it is to get dopamine i will yeah. do it because i've got nothing else to to work on to focus on so um you know if, if i'm gonna go go to the gym first thing in the morning great and then it's like okay i have like three hours to enjoy this dopamine arc and then you know what are we going to do to make sure that we're not going crazy and just you know looking after ourselves so, so what are your techniques for managing that adhd i just i just try and keep myself busy i try and make sure that we have stuff planned at the weekend if we so football season's here again i mean it's always here isn't it so my husband's watching (laughs) bloody football and my husband's like watching football saturday sunday afternoon whichever one one or other of them and it's kind of embarrassing to admit this but and i've never really thought that i'm just filling the time but i look forward to that time because i can just sit and get some work done Mm -hmm. you know but and and in a like at the weekend when no one I've got no emails coming in no one's calling me there's no kind of demand from the outside world I can just sit and work on something I really want to work on mm-hmm. so I guess even those down times I'm just keeping myself busy but yeah there's a lot of you know the whole dopamine chasing is the reason that we're we're a bunch of addicts isn't mm-hmm. it we're just addicted to whether it's good stuff or bad stuff mm-hmm. I've I quit drinking in February um, haven't had a drink since then and Congrats. that's thank you it was it was uh, I want to say it was never an issue mm-hmm. but it was an issue enough for me that you know when I'd have a few glasses of wine on a Friday I'd just feel really anxious and crap on a Saturday and mm-hmm. it got to the point I thought I'm I'm just not enjoying it at all so yeah bit the bullet um how's that been yeah it's been it's been great like I don't really miss it I'm not someone who's um you know I'm sober and kind of evangelical about it if Mm. I wanted a glass of wine or a glass of champagne the problem is I don't know why I said champagne why not good choice I think I am (laughs) (laughs) the reality is I I can't have one yeah yeah, and that's the problem because you have that I mean the the dopamine impact of alcohol is just like Mm -hmm. basically the same as cocaine isn't it so you're just off the charts and then and then the next one not so much and then you know I'm 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 terrible for that so I'm I'm better to be nothing than all yeah yeah um, absolutely but yeah definitely dopamine chasing scrolling social mm-hmm. um eating crap mm-hmm. you know that's it really has to be managed and I I wonder if it's one of the benefits of being diagnosed younger like you were yeah and and kind of going through that you know it's still only been three years for me which is longer than a lot of people but it's still a relatively short amount of time huge yeah Yeah. absolutely i mean i I would say it took 10 years for me to really get my head around it and and that was at you know 15 years old let alone unpacking a lifetime of exactly And and a lifetime of i read this thing recently that just blew my mind 
and it was about how when we're under for people who are late diagnosed we've lived our lives unconsciously or subconsciously building these systems and constructs around us and for a lot of us that looks like chasing drama Mm. and chasing adrenaline and keeping our brain you know and our nervous system on fire and and flooded with cortisol and adrenaline and it was for me it was the weekend that the russell brand stuff came out and normally with something like that i'd be all over it i'd be like oh my you know on twitter what who is it like what's the program about and then following it and i i tried to really observe it because i really really recognize that pattern in me that pattern of you know chasing breaking news and Mm. being like chronically online and knowing everything that's going on online and being in my friends dramas and creating my own dramas and i just tried to kind of observe it and it was really interesting to observe how reading the breaking news and the headlines was kind of firing my body up so i mean even addiction in the way that we we don't even know we're doing it because how can we until we know that it's adhd you can't look back and realize that that was we were just trying to keep our brains stimulated Mm. in the same way we were doing you know five pills and when your mates are just doing one in the club Mm -hmm. and you know having three bottles of wine and not wanting to go to bed it's just it's excess isn't it and it's ridiculous but when you know why you can apply a bit of self-compassion i think love that and that's such an amazing way of of breaking it down and uh, again feel so incredibly seen by you um but but you know it's 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 so true and i think um one of the things i noticed with um with being a founder is one of the be- the times where I've got my ADHD most under control is actually like during fundraising, for example, mm. because then it's like you're on the biggest hunt, right? Yes. You know, we, we, we get the hunt, we yeah. eat, we don't, we die. And from like, because dopamine is the reward center of the brain, right? Yeah. So the thing that we, the thing that we can't get becomes the, 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 the biggest goal that we can achieve, right? Yeah. So for an ADHD person, having what you can't have or, or wanting what you can't have is like the biggest dopamine payoff right yeah. so just going into that cycle and it was like wow yeah putting myself through the most intense stress all of that stuff just for the payoff at the end yeah right um but it's it's super interesting how much of the world is is just run by people just chasing dopamine in that way just right, trying to get yeah, as big as payoff as they can yeah and the, well they say like 29% of, I don't know why, 29%, how can you work this out? But <laughs> estimated 29% of founders have ADHD. Okay. But I would say it's way higher than that. Probably, right? I mean, the, the vast majority of founders I speak to at least uh, have been diagnosed, believe they could be diagnosed. Um, but but it's also another interesting one because does, does you, you know, because anyone can become addicted to dopamine, of mm. course. You know, the big difference is ADHD brains require dopamine to uh, function mm. as a normal brain. Um, but does the prolonged and repeated exposure to dopamine, even for a neurotypical brain, mm. then lead to ADHD-like symptoms? Who knows? Yeah. No, it's fascinating. Is it? There's another stat about, is it, they estimate 75% of prisoners like male prisoners in male prisons are undiagnosed or undiagnosed Mm. adhd and it's i think there's that there's such a fork in the road isn't there and you'll know this more than more than me as a a boy being diagnosed there's such a fork in the road of you know are you just written off as a naughty kid Mm. that's like ignored and forgotten or are you taken down the route of uh, med- like going to see medicals, getting diagnosed, getting the support that you need. And I, I guess a lot of that's down to family structures and, you know, the support you have around you. But it's it's a real roll of the dice, isn't it? I was on the cusp of being kicked out of school, right? Yeah. And it was literally at that fork in the road and managed to get support, got the medication, which got me yeah. through uh, the rest of school because it was literally at that point. Yeah, um, proper sliding doors moment. Proper sliding it? doors moment, aren't yeah. they all? Aren't yeah. they all right? Yeah. Okay, got five questions to ask okay. everyone. Um, the first one for you is, what's the single biggest risk you've ever taken and what was the outcome? Single biggest risk I've taken was probably, I mean, I've got, I've got a lot to choose from. It was probably handing my notice in to my corporate job at BT on the day that they were queuing around the block at Northern Rock to 
take all their money out of the bank because the world was just about to collapse. So literally the day I went in to, yeah, hand in my notice to to start my first business, I that it, it was on the news and I was like, oh, this is weird, isn't it? What's, what's all this going to 2007? What's going on here? And I, I didn't really understand the implication of it, but I just kind of thought, I'll, I'll, I'll work it out. I'll yeah. be all right. So that was the risk. Did it pay? What was the rest of the question? Did it pay off? Yeah, yeah. What happened? I ended up bankrupt. Okay, okay, all right. <laughs> but I ended up bankrupt like seven years later. Fine. So, you know, that decision in and of itself, or that risk in and of itself, was the right thing to do. It was the the following years that again applying my ADHD filter to it answers everything that happened. Mm. But you know, it's always unfortunate. There's always collateral damage along the way, isn't there? And what was that business at the time? <laughs> it was a cupcake business. That was a cupcake business, yeah. right? Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. We we're doing a, a million pounds a year on cupcakes. Wow. I'd like seven shops between yeah about seventy staff. Um, yeah, a million pounds a year on like two pound fifty cupcakes. Amazing. Yeah, That's a lot it of was volume. crazy. It was really great, and it was, it was, kind of before its time as mm. well. It was, you know, there was a couple of companies in London doing it. Um, but yeah, it was kind of that that we like straddled that line between being a a cupcake company and almost like a marketing mm -hmm. company, like a lot of events and experiential things and working with brands and stuff like that. Um, but yeah, it was, it was, it was a wild and traumatic ride and the wheels well and truly came off and I ended up bankrupt and yeah, there was a lot of collateral damage, a lot of people that were, um, out of pocket from it yeah yeah really tough and, and how was that experience of you know being at that point pulling yourself back out of it a lot of people go through that and they're like cool done with entrepreneurism yeah. not for me not worth the risk you know what was that like and um, amazing to see you know you, you go back again and and have great outcomes i think that's all you can you know what what are you gonna do i remember at the time my dad saying are you going to get a job now? You know, like, pl please, you are going to get a job now. And it just wasn't really an option. Mm. It never felt like an option. I just feel, you know, we joke, don't we, about being completely unemployable. And I really am. I'm incredibly demand avoidant. I, even when I was working at BT, like the most corporate job, I'd created my own role. They were, they could never, I worked on the phones. I was like in the call center in business sales and we'd be given these like bonuses and I'd work out the way to make the most bonus. And so the, the targets and KPIs they had, which were really, really strict, I would never meet them. I'd, we ha there was a button on your phone literally called not ready and so that means I can't take a call and the target was like you know 10% of your day mine was always like 70% of my day because I would I'd I'd account manage the best customers that came through I'd take a note of them I'd get in touch when we had a good deal and so I'd always be offline but my sales were through the roof so they could never do anything about it so yeah, we, we create our own businesses, uh, you know, we create our own roles in these businesses and create ways that work, don't we? But um, yeah, I've lost track of the question, sorry. No, 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 that was great, <laughs> that was great. Okay, my next one for you is, what are you proudest of? Oh, I'm proudest that I kept going. I'm really proud of that. I'm really, I'm, I'm proud... I think it's only since my diagnosis I've been able to say I was proud. There's a lot of things that happened th over the last 15 years really that I haven't I haven't been proud of and I haven't really been able to see the full picture of it. I'm very I'm very quick to take the blame, feel like, you know, I must have done something awful even though I can't quite clearly see what that was um but I think having that space and distance you get a bit of a clearer picture on the things that happened um and yeah I can say I'm 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 proud of keeping on going through 
through times that were really, really tough. Yeah, that's amazing. And uh, it's that perseverance which ultimately will mean over the long enough time horizon you'll be incredibly successful, right? Because that's it. As long as we keep on going, it's just uh, a, mo a moment in time to wait for. I remember, you know, my dad, he, uh, he finally made his money at 59 years old. Wow. You know, and just kept on going. Lost everything at 47. Yeah. I mean, everything started again from scratch at wow. 47 zero. Um, so, yeah, you know, that's it. Like, I, I, I know time and time again that if you just keep on going... It, you eventually get what you want. Yeah, and it like is success this, you know, at the peak of Everest. It, it doesn't feel like that to me. I've had a success, and then a bankruptcy, and then huge success, and then and then not failure from you know. I sold like I had great success with my agency, and mm -hmm. then I sold that, and now I'm just having, I'm having a different a different version of success, which for me is about working with my brain mm -hmm. and working from home and having flexibility and working less someone I was talking to recently was saying about with ADHD people we feel this need to like fill our time and mm -hmm. fill our brains and I'm really trying to break that habit so it success just looks different at different stages of your life doesn't it it's not it's not about I'm a huge believer in making money, you know, having a nice lifestyle, all of that. I have no shame around that, but it's not always, that's not always the key, is it? Or growth isn't always the key, you know, the big teams, the big mm. name, the ego, all of that. Is, it just looks a bit different to me at the moment. A hundred percent. And I actually uh, think one of the biggest issues that founders have is, uh, almost a misalignment with their own idea of success. Yeah. Because actually they're like, no, 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 I want the LinkedIn thing. I want yeah. the, you know, we raised X amount. We did all these things. Yeah. But actually at a massive cost to their own outcome, right? And it's it's literally where ego and, you know, what you need at a deeper level clash yeah. massively. It's someone else's dream, isn't it? It's what they've seen online and they think, I speak to so many founders and I did this exercise with someone recently. She was saying to me, right, like where you are now in one column and then in the third column where you want to be and then the middle column is like, you know, the bridge between. And I was writing in the third column and I could sort of feel myself getting into this like very masculine like hustle energy mm -hmm. and I was like, I want to write my book and I want to be on TV and I want to be known for this. And, and I kind of sat back and I thought, oh, actually, do like that's what I think. I, do I actually want that? Because that's mm. going to mean being out of the house a lot and traveling and you know do and being r very very exposed to like rsd stuff like being online more and being more vulnerable there and I, it didn't take me long to realize that that's actually not what i want at all but it's mm. scary how we just jump into that and and kind of embody that for a mm. while don't we 100 uh, another thing that I'm, I'm so grateful for and it sounds like it's the same for you but but tell me otherwise is you know because you achieved seven figure business so early on right mm. there are people who will you know be in a corporate career till 40 years old and in the back of their mind be like oh you know my dream is to build a seven figure business yeah. for example and then it could take them to 60 years old to reaching that and then realizing like, oh, wait, it's not about building a seven figure exactly, business, right? Yeah. Having that early and then being able to see, well, actually, that's not necessarily going to be fulfilling. And there is much more to life than just building towards commercial. And don't get me wrong, love the lifestyle, and everything else. Yeah. But, you know, that realization and I think it does allow you to start exploring new pathways in life to say, well, now that I realize these things don't matter, what really does matter to me? Totally. And as we both know, when you're chasing that seven figure business because because there's people online talking about their seven figure business their mm -hmm. eight figure business their whatever you don't un you don't know the the full story do mm -hmm. you you don't it's like these coaches oh my like seven figure launch yeah but you spent like 900 grand on <laughs> facebook ads come on like let's tell the truth about this because there's there's if we're going to like tout this authenticity and transparency and stuff we can't be out there 
just talking about even with investment people do it with investment all the time don't they we got this investment yeah but how much have you given away yeah and also what money what's revenue exactly because that's not the end goal right and and what do you want like what do you want it's not just about having this story this like cv you know linkedin cv that looks perfect when Mm. people are scrolling the feed it's i just yeah i think we've I think we've really conflated like success with with what looks good mm. online, haven't we? One hundred percent. We didn't even announce the last connected fundraise, just because we were like, we don't need to. No, it's and an internal thing. It's just an internal yeah. thing, and also it's not a, a marker of success for no. us, right? You know, we we have our, our goals. We have these other things, but we actually didn't announce it in the end, just because we thought one, you know, you're so much negativity online. Yes. Right, uh, all, all the time. There's so much negativity online. Um, the founder community at times, and I get it completely, we've all been through this, but can be a very bitter community 100%. at times, right? Yeah. I used to be do stand-up, very, very yeah. similar, right? Yeah. A lot yeah. of negative, <laughs> a lot of toxicity, a lot of ADHD. Um, very, very similar. Like, you know, people don't like it when, you know, they see people who they used to struggle alongside start to do well. Yeah. Um, which is a shame. Which it is, a, is shame. a shame. But I think it's the same in anything, isn't mm. it? It's, and it's it's really sad to see it. But yeah, I, th- I mean, I said to you before, there's just too much dick energy, isn't there? Mm. In, in like the, the founder space, particularly male founders. And I think, and also, you know, getting investment, not only is it harder, increasingly harder to get it, unless you use a, amazing platform like connected um but it's not the it's not like all it's cracked up to be is it's then you're then managing as you say you're then managing like these investors and i've i've made some i've made some terrible investments and it's really easy to go into it as as like oh yeah i'll put a bit of cash in there that'll Mm -hmm. be fun and without understanding the level of um like management that relationship takes as we've discussed before to to really see the success that you want so i think yeah i think there can be some naivety on both sides can't there a hundred percent all right my last one for you is 15 year old amanda walks in the room right now what are you going to tell her oh do you know what this question makes me so emotional because i've been so awful to myself my whole life I, I, it just, whenever people talk about inner child stuff, it just, I'm like, it just makes me really emotional because I think that when you grow up in the 80s and 90s, in a time where, um, you know, the world's kind of, it felt like the world was opening up, there was so much available to us and there was so much opportunity and friends were going off to uni and not at 15 but you know around Mm. that time and um doing really well in school and there was I had so much internal angst um anger confusion like I just didn't know I didn't know what it was and to think that it took me until I was 42 to get my answer is just really really sad so i think i'd just give her a big hug amazing um amanda where where can people find you uh instagram at amanda perry linkedin is at amanda perry uk i think um or join the founder brain community on facebook if you are an adhd founder visionary or leader amanda you're an absolute legend thank you so much for coming on the show thank you so much for having me i loved it Thanks for watching the episode. And if you haven't subscribed, please hit subscribe below so that you can support the podcast and we can keep on bringing you amazing new guests. If you want to see the other amazing episodes in this podcast, click into our series section. As ever, if there are any other guests or topics you want us to explore, just let me know in the comments and we'll do our best to bring someone in.